Welcome back to the main channel. We hope you have enjoyed the paper rounds and chat sessions. Now to the next part of the conference, which will all be about posters. We have 10 wonderful posters for you in store. Next up is a sneak peek of each poster, after which we would like to, you to vote for your preferred poster, because the poster with the highest amount of votes will win a prime time slot on this very channel. A more detailed explanation will follow shortly, but first let's have a look at all the posters. Such question is, what lessons have we learned from the first-hand experiences of Bulgarian journalists on safety, violence, threats and the impact of impunity on their everyday practice? My main findings show that there is no improvement over a whole decade in the environment in which journalists work and harassment of media workers is still rife. And more importantly, there is no effort from the Bulgarian authorities to address this issue. In 2009 and 2090, when the research was conducted, journalists and particularly investigative reporters still face significant threats to their safety, including physical and psychological attack. Um, what I would like to see as a useful follow-up to my research is that I plan to conduct more comprehensive study of emergency measures and legislations introduced by the Bulgarian government with the onset of the pandemic in 2020 that are yet to be removed and are posing further threats to journalism practice in Bulgaria. My research question is whether there is evidence in the UNESCO Observatory of Killed Journalists to support the idea proposed by UN Special Rapporteur Agnes Calamard that new human rights law mechanisms are needed to fight impunity in attacks on journalists. My main findings thus far indicate that such human rights law mechanisms could be effective in preventing impunity. The UNESCO database shows that about 90% of journalist killings go unsolved. Further research will involve supplementing the UNESCO database with local news sources and rule of law rankings to determine exactly what aspects of Calamard's proposals would make the most sense and be the most effective. So the aim of this research is to establish a framework for more comprehensively understanding the significance of safety violations against journalists in terms of their wider societal implications. Uh, and based on an empirical gaps analysis, uh, the research finds that the safety violations should be recorded not only as manifestations of aggressions against individual journalists, but importantly in relation to how such attacks occasion circumstances of civil diminishment of uh, associative and communicative civil life. Uh, so this requires not only understanding that and what safety violations occur, um, but addressing the full complexity of why they occur, the causes, as well as understanding uh, what is at stake for society when journalists are attacked, so the consequences. So useful follow-up for my research would be exploring how this conceptual framework can be developed and translated into a practical tool for monitoring safety violations against journalists. This is Faisal Elberger presenting a poster paper on securing safety and protection of journalists in a challenging environment in a transitional situation, Sudan, after the success of the popular revolution of December 2018. My research question is whether the transitional government of Sudan will manage to open the space through political and legal reforms to ensure safety and protection of journalists, including women journalists. My main results show that the transitional government of Sudan is experiencing and expressing good political will to do so by having partnership 
with UNESCO, Sudan, and other international and local partners, including civil society engagement. Adoption of the UN plan of action on the safety of journalists and the issue of impunity, and other international and regional standards of safety of journalists is an essential issue to reach the goals and objectives of journalist safety. Strategic advocacy policies and campaigns are to be done by all partners to engage the government institutions with the civil society, especially rights group and media and journalist associations to work together towards achieving the goals and achievements of journalist safety. Hello, my name is Marta Hoiby and I am presenting this poster on behalf of Professor Rune Ottosen and myself. Our research question is, in what way is reporting from conflict areas affected by threats and violence? To investigate this, we did a larger study for the Norwegian Committee for the UNESCO, interviewing 102 journalists and editors covering war and conflict in seven countries. The results show that one of the questions that really affected their concerns about safety was the journalistic principle of objectivity. Safety came out as a main reason for why it was important for them not to take sides with any party of the conflict, and interviewees repeatedly returned to ideas about objectivity when discussing safety measures. As a useful follow-up research, we consider more in-depth investigation into perceptions of the role of the press is needed. This field of study could benefit from more knowledge about how media professionals define themselves and their course, and we also recommend more qualitative research into the issue of self-censorship. Hi, I'm David Howard on behalf of Triple C Research Team. We're going to present the question to what extent and how does the triple relation between the media, the state and organized crime groups hinder freedom of press in Mexico. We argue here, based on 39 interviews to journalists and on an in-depth research review, that this triple relation, mostly in terms of information, security and financial resources, has led to a de facto restriction of freedom of press in the form, mostly, of self-censorship, control of editorial lines and forced silence. All of this in a context of liberal precarity and virtually absolute impunity. We think our research could shed light into these dynamics and to suggest forms to actually start solving them proposed by the same journalists. We think it's very, very important to actually listen to them. Thank you very much for your attention. The following are my research questions. What are the working conditions and safety measures that past media offer to freelance journalists? And what's the main profile of the past freelance journalists referring to gender, academic career, employment status, etc.? The main results are that in the Basque media, it's common to establish per piece contracts with freelance journalists with very low rates. Apart from that, the profile of the Basque conflict journalist is young, and in terms of academic training, most of them have communication studies. Besides, most of the journalists work for national and international media and they fund their own safety equipment or training. Finally, it is intended to expand the academic field to Spanish media since, according to the CNT report, they are the ones that offer the worst conditions. Furthermore, one of the main aims is to start a debate about the working and safety conditions of journalists with different interlocutors in the subject. Hello there, my name is Dr. Josiah Sabukente and my topic is safety of journalists in Nigeria. The research question is, what is the level of safety of journalists in Nigeria?
Findings reveal that there is a very high low level of safety in Nigeria as several journalists and media houses are attacked and killed in Nigeria in their line of duty. The paper recommends that there should be increase in public awareness and campaign against violence on journalists as they perform their constitutional responsibility. Thank you. The research questions for this poster presentation are, do media organizations adopt specific measures for the safety of journalists? Are there policies in the media that deal exclusively with the protection of journalists' physical and psychological safety? What measures do journalists undertake to ensure their safety? Some of the main results from the research are, there is a need for a documented safety policy for media organizations. There is a structured procedure for journalists when their safety is compromised. Journalists lack insurance cover aside those personally acquired. Safety is orally communicated. Journalists are aware of UNESCO's journalists' safety indicators. Some follow-up for this research are what determines journalists' safety policy in media organizations? Documentation of journalist safety measures and practices. An investigation of news organizations' use of oral communication in opposition to documented policies. The research faces the following question. How the use of judicialization of information contribute to hinder the work of journalists in moments as critical as the electoral ones? To answer the question, the study analyzed the legal action taken by the newspaper Folha de São Paulo during the Brazilian presidential elections of 2018. The results show that the role of the press is essential to follow the scenes related to elections. The study shows how judicialization can be a way of seeking to control freedom of press and that judici judiciary has a fun fundamental role in protecting this right. I would consider it I use it follow-up for the research to continue monitoring this type of lawsuits. Many thanks for all the post presentations uh, and for sending uh, in their videos. I already touched on it very briefly, but we now need the input of the audience. You have just watched uh, a short summaries of the 10 poster abstracts for this conference, and one of those is about to get the opportunity to be shown, uh, pre uh, to, be shown to the entire audience. You will determine which of these posters will earn itself a prime time slot on this very channel. Uh, of course, all poster authors will have the chance to present their work in a more elaborate fashion later on during the poster chat sessions, but a lucky one will be shown right here and now. So, for the next part, we would like to ask everyone in the audience to express their opinion in the live comments. Which, which poster presentation has ended a, a preliminary presentation on this very channel. Please let us know in the live comments by writing down the name of the author or authors whose work has made the biggest impression on you, or whose poster looks uh, to be the most promising field for future research, or whose poster sparks your interest. Pick the poster you would like to hear more about and just simply write down the names in the live comments. In a few minutes, we will announce the winner whose presentation video will then be shown. So let's get started. Please start voting in the live comments on the left of your screen at the button, ask the guests. 
To enlighten you a little further on the subject of the posters, we are honored to welcome Jackie Harrison, UNESCO Chair and Professor of Journalism at the University of Sheffield, to the studio. She will say a few words while we collect the votes and await the results of the live comments. Please keep voting in the meantime, everyone. Uh, welcome, Professor Harrison, and thank you for tuning in with us today. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak about the posters while you do that very important job of voting. I imagine it's quite difficult um, to vote. Um, I see within all of these posters some really excellent work and some really promising and interesting um, activities ahead. So it's really, you know, overwhelming to see um, the fantastic work that you've done. But I thought I'd just tease out a couple of themes as they hit me while I was reading all the posters and uh, looking at the videos. I think one of them is relationships and the other one is about responsibility. Um, news journalism naturally, of course, exists within a set of complex relationships. Of course it does. With the state, a, round, a wide range of non-state actors, with sources, with other news media, and of course with the public, all of which result in some positive and some very negative interconnections. Divorce from these relationships is very rarely possible. And where news media undergo uh, forms of capture, we've heard a lot about media capture and where coexistence and a pushback against subservience or control can actually just be dangerous and too often deadly. And we've seen in these posters in the context of Mexico, we see a relationship which highlights the triple independence of media, state and organised crime groups and how it's important to better understand how such relationships lead to restriction of freedom of expression with absolute impunity and more research is needed on that, absolutely. In Bulgaria, we've been told about the corruption and collusion between media, politicians and local oligarchs, which threatens journalists and their journalism. And again, all these threats are being undertaken with impunity. And they further evolved when um, 2009 is compared with journalist perceptions a decade later. Today, more sophisticated forms of legal and online violence and intimidation have been um, highlighted and again, really worthy of much more research. Still thinking about relationships, um, we see research that makes it the important point that an open, safer space for journalists in Sudan following a new political transition requires different players and relationships between government media organization, journalists, civil society organizations and community groups, all to work together to develop new mechanisms and measures and continue to adopt that UN action plan. We're told in Nigeria how during the NSARS protest, um, journalists have been caught in the middle of um, different groups, in the middle of harassment and violence from elements of the public and from security forces, irrespective of gender or medium. Um, in Brazil, we've been invited to look at the relationship between the news media and the judicial system to see how interference can hinder the work of the press, but also to look at the way in which the judiciary also has the potential and the responsibility to protect the press during an election period to facilitate greater freedom of expression. But we're also being asked to consider whose responsibility it is in challenging environments to keep journalists safe. We've heard that in the context of Nigeria, despite high levels of violence towards journalists with impunity, news organisations tend not to support their journalists through form and formal written safety policies within media organisations or through adequate insurance, even though individual journalists are aware of UNESCO's own safety indicators. Um, safety may be communicated orally through future research. Uh, sorry, future research has been identified as being needed to explore these very important um, ways in which media organisations support journalists to cope with psychological and physical violence. Um, in the Basque country, we looked at how international conflicts have been covered and shows how mainly it's young freelancers who are still remaining a neglected group who attend, amongst other things, to be awarded per piece contracts at row, row, low rates of pay and are left to fund and ensure their own safety. A, a neglect of responsibility here by media organisations. Um, journalists interviewed in seven countries talked about safety in connection with the principle of objectivity, where a major safety strategy for ensuring their own safety, taking own responsibility for their safety, is to stay objective and not to take sides. And yet the researchers point out there is a need also to better understand self-censorship in those sorts of contexts. But it is, of course, the ultimate 
the case that the ultimate responsibility for individual journalist safety should lie with a functioning mechanism of accountability for those who attack journalists and who should be brought to account through, for example, a new international human rights law mechanism, a standing instrument which focuses on journalism as an individual human right. Currently, the reality is stark. 90% of cases of killings of journalists are unresolved. And we look forward to further research that supplements UNESCO's observatory of killed journalists with data from local news sources and rule of law rankings to see how such a standing instrument could be more, more effective. And finally, um, we've also got to consider and understand the manifestations of violence against individual journalists. It is important to understand that, but research presented to us in the posters also argues it's the case that we need to consider both causes and consequences of such attacks, because those attacks understand undermine um, journalism itself. So I've had a very brief moment and I feel very privileged to have it, but I must stop. Time is brief, but I do hope my brief consideration of your posters has done them justice and I can't wait to hear more about them. Thank you. Thank you very much for your enlightening words, Jackie. Uh, we can't wait to dive into the posters later, uh, but first things first, the vote has been closed and the results are in. Let's see who is the lucky winner, shall we? Okay, Bruce, can I ask you to do a drum roll with me? Yes, if we know the, the Do winner. we know the winner? Have we heard a winner? The winner is... The winner is, is Dr. Comfort Bulas from Nigeria. Very congratulations, Dr. Comfort Bulas. Uh, we will sh now show your poster video to our entire audience. Hello, my name is Comfort Bulus, also presenting on behalf of Dr. Ayo Dili, a poster presentation on the topic, Safety of Journalists, Measures, Practices, and Policies of Selected News Organizations. The research questions were prompted by the fact that organizations develop policies in order to ensure efficiency and a collaborative working experience. Policy creation is central for maintaining standards for how things are done consistently. It explains who, what, why, and when an action is to be completed. Policies are closely related to procedures, which are the steps outlined for policy implementation. Procedures are descriptive presentations of the actions taken for realization of policies. These actions often guide the fair and equitable treatment of all staff. Although policy documents do not provide solutions to all problems or challenges in an organization, they serve as a guide and cover for general procedures. The benefits of safety and safety policies are not universally appreciated. Risk management is often implemented once it's too late. Some managers hope that safety mishaps will not occur, but they do. The welfare state of journalists working in any news organization is not dependent on just the economic and social factors related to the life of the journalist, but majorly on how the media and communication systems are organized. Media policy measures and the welfare state of an organization together conceptualize the media welfare state. The three research questions for this study were, do media organizations adopt measures for the safety of journalists? Are there policies in the media that deal exclusively with the protection of journalists' physical and psychological safety? What measures do journalists undertake to ensure their safety? In relation to the main results of this research, it is worthy to note that laws or policies are created in countries to maintain order. They are made to be implemented. In relation to journalists, laws are enacted in order to promote, protect, 
promote freedom of expression, safeguard lives and professional rights. Despite the signing of the Freedom of Information Bill into law on the 24th of May 2001, journalists continue to face the challenge of safety in Nigeria. Having studied the selected news media organizations, some of the main results of this research were security officials accompany journalists only when they are with top government officials or in volatile areas. The selected news organizations do not have any official safety policy document. The journalism code of conduct and interpersonal communication between journalists forms the bedrock for journalists' personal safety policies. Safety measures adopted by journalists are synonymous with UNESCO's safety guidelines. There is a procedural guideline that journalists follow once safety has been compromised. Journalists need safety insurance cover. Safety guidelines are usually drawn up and communicated before the national elections. We believe the following would prove useful as follow-up for our research. There is a need for research on journalist safety policies in media organizations that exist within Nigeria and their determinant factors. The documentation of journalist safety measures and practices for future reference and development of better policies is a necessity. The implementation of journalist safety laws in Nigeria, or the lack of it, should be studied to determine the factors responsible. An investigation of news organizations' use of oral communication in opposition to documented policies could provide insight on the art of communicating policies. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Boulos and Dr. Joseph, for this thought-provoking presentation. Uh, to conclude this plenary session of this channel, uh, we would like to welcome back Professor Dr. Yap de Jong of Leiden University for a few parting words. Dear academic friends, all is well that ends well. We almost are at the end of the academic conference. Let us combat the online harassment of journalists, especially of women journalists together. Let us collaborate in our research with the UNESCO Chairs on Safety of Journalism, like Jackie Harrison, and thank you, Jackie. And fellow researchers, thank you for all your research forming the heart of the matter. Thanks for your presentations and your contributions to the discussion. Please do continue the scientific discussions and research. We especially say thanks to all the speakers, the referents and the organizers of this conference. First, we thank the moderators, a marvelous duo, our Leiden alumnus and now professor of journalism at Auburn University USA, Bruce Matsvairo, and master student, journalism and new media, Romy Heimans. I'm very proud. Thank, thanks to UNESCO's Theresa Korbacher and Guy Berger, to the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Joanne van Rijswijk, Rachel Baas and Anne-Sophie Sprenger, and to the technical wizards of foreign affairs, to Wirtz, Wirtz Film and Bourgogne, and to my fellow academic organizers from Leiden University, Willem Koetseruiter and Remco Breuker. And last but certainly not least, master students in journalism and new media at Leiden, University and our great organizer of this extraordinary 2020 edition, Charlotte Bovo. Well done. To you all, I say enjoy the other conferences tomorrow. Stay creative, stay critical, stay healthy and safe. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Dion. Uh, we have arrived at the final part of our conference, the poster chat sessions. Uh, this part is similar to the paper chat sessions. All poster presenters are divided into four separate chat rooms, which will be active simultaneously. Please choose the chat room which sparks your interest. The grouping is as follows. Chat room one features Lada Trifonova-Price and Edward Carter. 
Chat room two is reserved for Sarah Torsner, Faisal El Bagir, and Runa Otosan, and Marta Hoibi. In okay, chat room like, uh, three. In chat room three, <laughs> our two largest teams led by uh, David uh, <laughs> Jauregu Jau and Annette Unda are present. Lastly, chat room four features uh, Josiah Sabo Kente, Ayodele Joseph, and Comfort Bolus, and Christian uh, Bonfim, as well as Ulaila Kmuka. Please select a breakout room to enjoy an elaborated presentation on two or three posters and join the conversation afterwards. The poster chat session will kick off at 7.30, so feel free to get yourself a refreshing beverage in the meantime. Last but certainly not least, Romy and I would like to uh, thank you uh, for your attention. We hope to see you back uh, next year at next year's edition of the Academic Conference. Thanks for tuning in.